Welcome to the HR Empowerment Podcast, where we will uncover strategies and new insights from HR professionals who discuss up-to-date regulations, best practices, and the most pressing topics like diversity and equity, leadership, dealing with difficult situations, and much more that affect your bottom line and business. Thanks for joining us. Wendy Sellers here, the HR lady. Welcome back to five ways employees drive us crazy and what to do about it. The second topic we're going to discuss is they make so many mistakes. Well, here's a hint. Osmosis and mind reading is not a thing with human beings. We're going to dive into providing feedback as well as training and development methods in order to remove as many mistakes as possible from your workplace. But first, you have to leave that judgment. It's your job to get them to do things right. But how do you do that? Put it in writing. Give them deadlines. Mutually agreed upon deadlines would be the preference. And then follow up. More on that in a minute. So how do you get them to do their job right? I like to start with three simple questions. I call them the three W's. Who, what, and when. Who specifically needs to do the task, what specifically needs to be done, and when specifically does this need to be done by. This is very important when you're talking in groups because if you're talking to two, three people, all those other people are going to go, oh, my coworkers got it. And then they're going, no, my coworkers got it. Oh, no, my other coworkers got it. So you have to be very, very specific on the who, the what, and the when. Three W's, keep that in mind. Your team is only as good as your, aka managers, follow-up skills. Write things down. Schedule ongoing meetings with your team members. Follow up on your mutual agreements. Observe any signs of growth, progress in the task or with the person. Check in. Make sure that you have an open door. Even if you don't have a door, make sure people know that you have an open door and that they can stop by and ask questions at any time. Communicate the impact of the three W's. Watch for changes in your relationships. If people are starting to avoid you or avoid eye contact, something might be going on. And then Grab that mirror and evaluate yourself. Remember, you might be part of the problem. I want to go over a few statistics here about retention. I, I love using Gallup. They do all the research for you, and then you can just go ahead and look at their stats and say, where is my company? So per Gallup, at least 75% of the reasons for very costly voluntary turnover, so when people quit, come down to things that the manager can influence. Managers who can't or won't do anything about these factors that drive turnover can expect to be filling job requisitions soon. And let's talk about that. Maybe not even filling them, just putting job ads out there, but we have a staffing shortage in the United States. So you're going to have a shortage for quite some time in your organization. So why do employees leave voluntarily? The number one reason per Gallup and let me just stop right there and tell you, this was pre-pandemic that this survey was done. So it might possibly be different right now. But the number one reason was not actually pay and benefits. It was career advancement or promotional opportunities. 32% of people who quit their job was because of career advancement or promotional opportunities. That's something that you, a manager, can affect. 22% quit because of pay and benefits. That's also something that you, a manager, can affect. Now, maybe you can't change your benefits. Maybe you can't change the pay, but you can definitely go to bat for them and say, I want to give them a promotion so that they can get to the next pay grade. Other reasons are lack of fit to a job. 20% of employees who quit said, I didn't even fit that job. Whose fault is that? That's the hiring manager's fault. Why did you hire them into that position if they didn't fit that job? And I know some of you might be saying, because there's a staff shortage and we're desperate, and I get it, but they're just going to leave. And when they leave, they're taking that time and talent with them, and it's costly, very, very costly. 17% said the reason they quit their job was specifically because of managers or the general work environment, so the manager themselves. And then other re reasons are flexibility, scheduling, and then job security. So keep these things in mind. 
don't say I can't affect that because you possibly can by going to bat for your employees. Let's talk about even more items, feedback and accountability. Accountable people seek feedback. And interesting enough, feedback creates accountable people. Isn't that interesting? So I don't have time is no longer an excuse to say I don't have time to meet with that employee and talk to them about X, Y, Z. You need to make sure that they trust you. Trust and doubt is huge and a huge reason why people leave or worse, I call it quit and stay. They quit giving you the bare minimum so they don't get fired and they could still take that paycheck home and they're there, but they've kind of checked out. The shadow of doubt lingers over every decision to trust you, but you can do a lot to reduce that doubt. What can you do? Transparency is super important. Now, let's face it, that's to a degree, right? You can't tell all your employees everything that's going on, especially with their coworkers, because that's confidential information and you want that coworker to trust you. So transparency to a degree is very important. Tell them what you can tell them of what's going on, even when things aren't going great. Let them know. Otherwise, they make things up in their head and rumors go around. What else can you re- do to reduce doubt is respect. Respect people and they will respect you. Respect is earned, right? But guess what? It's even earned for leaders. Just because you have a title behind your name doesn't mean people are going to automatically respect you. And then feedback. Feedback, feedback, feedback is so important. So let's talk about feedback a little bit more. Feedback isn't about surprising somebody. The sooner you provide feedback, the more the person will understand the issue or the concern. And be very specific when you're giving feedback. Tell the person exactly what you need them to improve or continue doing. This ensures that you stick to the facts and there's less room for ambiguity and confusion. Training is for the current job. Development is for the future job. Why do you want to develop them for a future job? For retention. That's why. When is training needed? Training is needed throughout the entire employee life cycle. Of course, it's needed for new hires. I don't care if the new hire that you just brought in has 25 years experience doing exactly what you do. It was at a different company. They need training for your software, for your rules, your processes, your procedures. So training is for the current job. When is it needed though? It's needed from everything from new hires to promotions. Obviously, new hires are new to the company. They don't know anything about even where the restroom is, uh, how to do timesheets, or the technology possibly that you're using at your company. Sure, you may have hired them because they have the skills, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need, and they got that somewhere else, but everything at your company is going to be unique. So you need to take the time to train new hires. When you're just throwing them into the role, you're throwing them into a setup for failure. So make sure you have a plan, 30, 60, 90 day plan for training new hires. This is the same thing for anybody who's new in a role. Even if they're promoted internally, there should be a plan, minimum of 30 days, possibly 90 days. For some roles that takes a lot longer, it might be up to a year. If you're changing any software in your organization, Make or any other kind of technology, make sure you plan on training all your people on that. Development, though, like I mentioned, is for a future role. And while we hate to give people a future role opportunity because that means we lose them maybe to a different department or we now have to backfill them, at least we don't lose all of their knowledge, skills, and abilities that they learned at your organization. They're still there, just in a different role. If employees say, I want to be in a different role, I know it's difficult to hear, but start planning to develop them for that role. Otherwise, another company will do so. Make sure your employees aren't stagnant because many people will leave, like I said, in that Gallup poll because they want a new career opportunity. They want growth. Okay, so let's talk about development for a future role. Now, hopefully this future role is in your organization, but even if it's not, If you're developing somebody for a future role and they end up taking that somewhere else, they're going to give you amazing reviews and maybe they'll send their friends to fill the role that they're leaving. But ideally, we would like to develop people for our organization, right? Uh, Make sure you're asking your employees during these regular feedback sessions, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do next year? What about in three years? What about in five years? If you ask, they just might tell you and then you could help develop them 
and stay at your company longer instead of being stagnant and bored and then they leave. Remember that Gallup poll said most people leave because there's no career development opportunities in their current company. Create a plan with your employees, your individual employees, so that your training development is calendar driven. Why? We get busy and we forget about this. And then our employees walk out the door. Make sure that you are creating that plan so that you're boosting their confidence. They don't have doubt in you. They trust you and they want to work for you, work with you, and they're going to stay when times get tough. Let's talk a little bit about performance reviews. Ugh. Does the mere mention of a performance review make your heart sink? It does for mine. And I'm the HR lady. We save up our comments and our documents all year long of this person did something good, this person did something bad. And that's just a shame because giving and receiving feedback is key to engaging your employees every single day and keeping them on track. There has been a major shift in approach for performance reviews. I just call them feedback sessions because it should be both performance and behavior feedback. In the past, there was annual feedback, and now there's ongoing conversations. Believe it or not, I'm probably one of the few HR people that can't stand the annual review. I like them to go away completely. Now, some of you need to have them for some compliance reasons. Contracts require them. Maybe you're working with the government and that contract requires them. That's okay, but that doesn't mean you can't have ongoing conversations, frequent conversations throughout the year. Listen, annual reviews are too late. They're often a monologue, not a dialogue. They're very formal. They stifle conversation. Uh, they're rushed. Then there's information in there that the employee doesn't even know about because you've been saving information all year long and you never talk to them about it. And the once a year review is rarely followed up with actual appropriate action. And it's very stressful for everyone involved. No one should be surprised at the content of an annual review. So let's move these performance and behavior conversations to more frequently. Let's start with 15 minute conversations once a month with each individual employee. Now, some of you might be gasping because it's timely and it's time consuming, but you know what? If that employee finds out something in that 15 minute monthly conversation that they can fix, it'll be fixed right then and there, not 11 months down the road. If starting out monthly is too much for you, just start out quarterly and then go bi-monthly and then monthly. But I guarantee you, it gets easier. The first conversation might be awkward because the employee is going, why is this person talking to me? And it's not my annual review period. They're either going to give you all this information and it's going to be a two-hour session, or they're going to clam up and say nothing. And then the second conversation will get easier because you're going to put it on their calendar and they're going to expect it. So you put recurring meetings on everybody's calendar, including yours, every quarter, let's start small, or every month then they're going to know that they have a lot of time with you. Again, it just needs to be 15 minutes to have a conversation about what's going well, what's not going well. And of course, if there is something super serious, especially if it's something negative, you want to address that sooner than later. You don't even want to wait for that 15-minute conversation. When you're having these 15-minute conversations, you know, don't make it so formal that it's scary, but do take notes. Uh, your note could be an email follow-up. Guess what? That's documentation. That counts as documentation. And then when you're saving all that documentation for your forced annual review, you all have it already. You're both on the same page. For some of you that don't have email in the workplace, maybe you're in manufacturing or construction and, and you don't use email with your employees, that's okay. You could send the email to yourself, print it out, and hand it to them. So now they have the documentation. If you're wondering what do I talk about in these 15-minute conversations, you could literally ask these three questions. What's going well? What's not going well? What can I help you with? And then shut up and listen. The case for change is now. Feedback is often incredibly unreliable, especially when it's those fancy performance review forms that I personally do not like. Why? Because ratings are often a reflection of the reviewer, and we don't always ask the employee to do a self-rating. So if you are going to continue doing a rating form, please get your employees involved in rating themselves as well. And here's a scary thought, maybe even rating you. Ooh, make sure though that you understand your rating system 
and there should be definitions of what the ratings are. Generally speaking, though, the goals of feedback, there's three of them. It's so that you can tell your employee, I see your good or bad performance and behavior. I want to fuel your performance and behavior, and I want to reward your performance and behavior. So three things, see, fuel, and reward. That is the purpose of feedback. There is a feedback fallacy, though. So if your people ignore you when you're talking to them, hmm, that probably means that you are criticizing them too much. The human brain scientifically responds to critical feedback as a threat, and it shuts down. So they're not intentionally ignoring you. Okay, some of them might be, but they're not intentionally ignoring you. If you are a threat to them all the time, their brain says, do not listen to this person. So focusing only on people's shortcomings or gaps, it actually doesn't enable their learning. It impairs it. Who would have thunk? Criticism assumes your way is better and inhibits their brain from listening because their brain is not listening to you at all. So look into that. I write about that in my in my book, and there's a lot of articles on it. Um, there's a great article with the Harvard Business Review called Nine Lies About Work and the Feedback Fallacy, and I think it's just fascinating to hear that information. So focusing on positive outcomes is really what you should be doing. I like giving the example of speaking French. So you've got a French client and all your employees speak uh, empl um, English and Spanish. And you're like, oh, by the way, tomorrow I need you to speak French because we got a French client. No matter how much you threaten them, no matter how much you criticize them, they're not going to come to work tomorrow and speak French. And so what you should have done was hired a French speaking employee or thought about that, getting that contract before you got that contract on your books. So interesting way to look at it is, again, if you're criticizing people, it's not going to change their learning. Be cognizant, again, of your ratings and what you uh, believe your rating system actually means. And then be cognizant of your perceptions and your judgments. Again, we all like to judge a little bit, but realize that everyone makes mistakes. It's how we learn. So when you're saying your employees driving you crazy because they make so much many mistakes, you're probably part of the problem. But it is how we learn is how to make mistakes. Ask yourself, is this person a continuous problem? Or is it just your perception? Because for some reason, you don't get along with them. Grab that mirror. Is this person too valuable to discipline? Hint, no one is. And when you say that someone is too valuable to discipline, maybe they're the only one that has a license that you need or a certification or a certain skill, all your other employees see that and they know that and they check out either figuratively or literally by resigning. So your action plan from today should be asking yourself, what skills do I need to focus on developing first with myself? What skill or activity are you going to practice over the next 30 days? And who do you trust to encourage you to do this and hold you accountable? In our next session, we're going to be talking about our employees have no common sense. I have two books, which you can find on Amazon or on thehrlady.com. Thank you for joining the HR Empowerment Podcast, brought to you by Aurora Training Advantage. We hope you've gained new insight and strategies to navigate the HR profession. We look forward to you joining us again on the HR Empowerment Podcast.